Have you ever been one of those people that all you'd envision was being famous to the point of whenever someone heard your name, they just went crazy? Um, you know, like you hear the Kings, you hear Kennedys, you hear Mandela, Maya, just say the name and people are like, you know, they just go crazy. That was actually my driving force for a long time. And, and I thought that's really what it was all about. And life has a way of teaching you lessons to help you realize it's a lot bigger than that. All the people that I named, I would believe that none of the stuff they did was in order to become famous, but they became famous because of their actions. And that's really where I'm at. Life has, has taught me some lessons that made me get out of the self-absorption and worried about being famous, which if I get there, I welcome it, but for a different reason, because obviously I succeeded at what my real objective, which is assisting people to change their life. Purpose of this video is to give you insight how I got to this way of seeing from where I used to be. How you guys doing? This is Ron Simplified Myers, author, podcaster, speaker, online clothing store, educational site. And how did I get to all that and get to here to speak with you today as far as sharing where my mission is and, and what it is all about? Well, let's first address that conversation about the name. I mean, because that in itself is a crazy story. It has to do with the the Ron Simplified Myers, because I always hear people say, is Simplified really your middle name? And I've gone back and forth on whether to make that legally my middle name, because I don't have one. And I remember I shared that with my mom, and she's like, oh, would you really change your name? And I'm like, oh, well, you didn't give me a middle name, so obviously you wanted me to fill it in. <laughs> so, But I've gone back and forth on that one. I still haven't said I'm in or out either way, but it's not at the top of my priority list at this point. But the reason the name came into existence to begin with is because I was looking to brand. And of course, you're going to go, at least I was going to go, with my name, Ron Myers. So I looked up ronmyers.com to see if I could actually own the domain name for my brand. And someone owned the name. And I think it was, they were offering it for like $4,000 that you could buy the name. And I'm like... You could get domain names for 99 cents. 99 cents, 4,000. Think it's time for us to figure out a different way to brand. So that's when I decided to search and find a middle name. Again, it's not a legal middle name, but it's a middle name to fill in. And so I started going down all these positive words, you know, a list on the internet. And it, it, nothing hit me until I got all the way to simplify, which you could, is all the way into the S's, but nothing else had hit me to that point. And I was like, simplify. Huh. I like that. Let me put that down. So I wrote it down and I said, okay, I'm in the S's. Let's see if there's some other words that'll grab my attention. And for some reason, the brain shut down from that point on. All it kept thinking was simplify. Okay, yeah, simplify. And I'm like, okay, simplify is a good word. It's a, it's a good example, but let's see if we can find something else. I couldn't see else, anything else on the, it was crazy. I really couldn't see any, if my focus wouldn't stay there long enough for any other words to come into focus. And I was like, this is crazy. So I went and I ran in there and shared that with my wife. I'm like, this is crazy. I came up, simplified, and now for some reason, my brain don't want to hear nothing else. And um, she said, that fits you. And I was, and it hit me, I was like, maybe that's what it is. Because an example would be, I was in the financial service field for 30 years, and we had a presentation that we would do across the kitchen table for families. I redid my presentation. Because I said, I want my presentation so simple that if a 10-year-old walked into the room, they would understand which decision their parents should make. An example of that's just me everything I do I'm like because it's easy to take some simple and make it complicated but how can we take things that are complicated 
and make them simple. And for me, that was the key because I said finances are not supposed to be complicated. But the industry has made it mystical. And I understand it's because it's their agenda because then you trust them to make all your decisions. But um, I didn't want that. I want people making decisions because of the knowledge that they have. And so I said, let me simplify this. But again, that's so for me, it was kind of like it hit and it made sense. And my wife validated it. And I was like, huh. So there you have it. That's how Simplified was actually born. So, but how did I get on the track that I am now? And what's my vision? As I said, it's bigger than the self-absorption one I had at the beginning, which was just to be famous, which was really just about me. To the point that I really want to make an impact. You know, we talk about legacy. And people are always saying, what will your legacy be? And, and for me, I said, everyone's creating a legacy. Most of us don't think of it that way, but you make a legacy every single day. Everyone that crosses your paths, you're making some kind of impact. Is it, good, is it a good impact? Or are you the example of what they don't want in their life? But you're making an impact, so you are leaving a legacy. But I decided I wanted to leave a legacy that would assist people and live way beyond me or even my name because families' lives changed because of the information that they received. And the, reason, the way I got to here is um, my wife and I, we were dated for nine years. And we're married for 23, total of 32 years. Now, I've had young ladies that heard me say nine years, and they were instantly like, nine years, there's no way in the world I'd have waited for nine years. I'd have been out. And I said, well, that's probably the reason we never dated and never will because you're a person that lives on things happen. You hear things, you just respond, but you don't get any information to make an intellectual conversation, uh, decision. And I said, because you never asked what was in the nine years. But let me share with you what took place in the nine years just to bring you up to date. In my early years, um, now, I don't know what I was doing in the younger years, around 12 or 13, but I've been trying to date since then, calling women my girlfriends or whatever. But uh, So I've, I've, I've been dating since about that, that age. But before, let's talk about the first nine years of my life, there was seven ladies, because my mom had seven sisters. So including my mom, you got eight women. Then my grandma, nine. And then my sister, who's a year younger than me, but still she had her little inputs. So you got 10 women that are speaking in my life the first nine years, telling me about life, telling me about women. Then about the age of nine is when the guys start coming in and they start giving a different perspective when it came to women. And what they were teaching me is it's about sowing your oats, sleeping around. The more women you have, the more you demand. Make sure you have the main one on the side but never, ever, and to this day, I'm 58, and still, I haven't had guys talk to me about being loyal and being committed. <laughs> that's crazy. I, I mean, that's just amazing. Even when I think about that, I'm like, that's amazing. Because it's programming. So in the earlier years, I had a lot of respect for women because I went for, I was programmed by ladies. When the guys came in and I started to watch some of the things that some women, it's sad that I, I switched gears and started listening to the guys because of what a few women did. I saw young ladies who said that they were going to wait until they got married to have sex. And they had sex before then, some of them with me. And then some of them ended up pregnant. Again, not with me. I didn't do the pregnant thing, but, you know. And I started to see women that would drink at clubs and go to go home with a guy the first night she met him and so my perspective on women switched and it went to the side of what the guys were teaching and I got to the point where I was like I'm never ever going to get married I'm going to be single the rest of my life because women are you can't be trusted and uh because guys had also told me when a woman says no she just she don't know what she really want. She's trying to play hard to get. All these kind of little different things. So I got to the point where I was like, yeah, you can't trust women. And so I was on that path 
of following what the guys had taught me, switched gears. And so that was the main thing in the first, the first uh, probably three to four years of our relationship. And, um, and also during that time, just so you guys understand, the reason it was probably able to get away with it more in those three to four years is because the fact is she was Japanese. So she was being challenged by family members who were basically going to disown her for dating me as a black man. Now, they didn't know in the earlier years, but we knew the racial stuff that was going on. So there were times she couldn't be with me, which made it easier for me to go out here and act crazy because those family members had such a uh, influence at the time. And I wasn't trying to push the envelope anyway because I was too busy trying to be the man. So, but eventually, one night, I had what I call the nightmare. In the nightmare, I caught Terry cheating. And I sat up quickly in my bed and my heart was beating fast. My shirt was wet from sweat. I was breathing hard and I was like, whew, man, how could she do that? Now think about it. I just told you I was out there acting a fool. I was out there trying to be the man. But my first thought is, how could she do this to me? So through that, nightmare i didn't know if that was telling me this is what's going on or it was telling me this is possibly what's going to take place if you keep doing what you're doing so i was like so it hit me i was like man this wouldn't even bother you unless you actually care about this girl and it's like <sighs> called her up it was like 12 12 midnight one o'clock in the morning i was like i love you i love you and i was committed from that point uh, forward but folks, understand the, 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 the conflict, or not conflict, but the way my story had to shift. Because I had took in the, taken in the programming from the guys of being the man. So I wasn't looking to be committed. That's why at first it wouldn't have even bothered me if she was messing around, if I didn't care. Because I was like, I don't care, you know. I never dishonored women. Don't, don't misinterpret what I did. Because I was brought up by women, so... Because of that, I've always honored the woman when I'm with her. I'm just saying, but from a committed, loyal perspective, I was not going to do that. So, but that nightmare made me make a shift. Because we do things for one or two reasons. Either to avoid pain or to gain pleasure. So because of the programming from the guys that I chose to take in, I take full responsibility for my acceptance of that programming because I had the two options. I had the programming from the, from the ladies, which I was following originally, and then I take in the programming from the guys, and that's what I chose to follow until that nightmare hit. So because of the programming from the guys, they were teaching me that it was pleasurable to have many women. Think about that. If you're programmed that is pleasurable to have many women, then obviously to have one woman equals what? Pain. Who's striving towards pain? And we as society keep asking why a lot of guys have a challenge with committing to a relationship or getting married. Hmm. Pain, pleasure. Until that nightmare like I had or something else makes a shift for a lot of guys, they're going to have a hard time. Even if they get married, if they haven't made the shift it's only time before they're going to cheat in that relationship. The shift has to take place, which is what happened to me, where it became more pleasure to have the one lady and pain to have many because I would lose her by having the many. You guys follow that? That was the shift. So here's a lady that I spent 32 years with. Um, we went through bankruptcy, had homes, lost homes, Told you we went through the racial battle, the fact that there were people that were going to disown her uh, for being with a black man. That was part of that nine years, and that kind of made the, the remaining balance of that nine years. Remember, I told you the first three or four years, I was just trying to be the, the man. But after that, it became the conflict of dealing with the other people. And, um, and just for those of you who are asking, yes, me and those people are tight today, but it wasn't until after all this time that had to... to, to 
work through in order to get to that level. But so we went through that. We went through the trying to have kids. We tried the different methods and um, everything that we tried was unsuccessful. But during that process, uh, during the research and stuff, they found cancer. And so at that point, her and I decided from the kid's perspective, we'll wait until she beats the cancer and then we'll revisit whether we're going to try other methods, whether we're going to adopt, but we'll do all that after she beats the cancer. Well, she ended up fighting the cancer for 17 years, 17 years. And unfortunately, I lost her six years ago to that cancer. And that was devastating for me because she was the person I had planned to be 100 years old with, walking on the beaches, plant, you know, at the parks. Um, she was my best friend. She was a person I ran with. I didn't run with guys. Um, I used to use the example, I'd tell people, I said, why well, I need to run around a bunch of knuckleheads? I said, uh, because, and the way I looked at it was, I didn't drink, so there was no reason for me to go hang out at a bar you know, sit with the guys, drink, watch sports and all that. There was no reason because I don't drink. I didn't need to go to strip club because if I was interested in that, I could always go and have her strip for me if that was the case. So when it came to sporting events, the sports that I liked, she liked also. So if I wanted to go see a game, she wanted to go. So you guys, could, there was no reason for me to, so she was my best friend also. So when she passed away six years ago, I lost my wife and my best friend all in one package. And that had, that gave, that, that, that forced me to really look at my life in a different perspective and start to see things differently. Um, did I really give my all? Was, could I have given more to the relationship? Did she know how much she meant to me? Could I have held her hands more because I know she's a person that loved to hug and, and hold hands and stuff. Could I have done that more? And those are the kind of questions I was starting to have. Those that know me again know that if, if you saw one of us, the other one was usually somewhere near because that's the relationship that we had. Matter of fact, her doctors had, because she came back and told me on many occasions, different doctors when we we're doing all the research on her cancer and stuff, that they were amazed that I was at every single appointment that she has and I sat in the rooms and I did everything and it was like I was always there. And they were saying, because most husbands drop their, 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 their spouse off and they leave and then they come back. And for me, I'm just like, whatever she's got to go through, I'm going through with her and that's just the way I looked at it. And I even had some guys doing that process make the comment that, well, if she can't have kids, that's a part of being a wife. And so, I mean, you need to go outside and get you a kid or you need to get divorced or something because your seed, you need, you need your seed, you know, your legacy. And folks, I didn't get it and I still don't get it. I, like I told them, I said, I'm committed to my wife. I'm committed to my marriage. Whatever she has to go through, I have to go through. We're in this together. This is not a Ron looking for what's best for Ron. This is, we're looking out as a unit, what's best for our unit. Why would I go out and devastate her and do something like that? And so for me, that was never even a thought process. And since I'm on the conversation about legacy, I tell people you're creating your legacy every single day. It's not through a seed that you, you create your legacy. Um, matter of fact, my family and friends get on me every Father's Day if we're at some kind of event and they tell all the fathers to stand or recognize the fathers and I don't participate and get up or whatever. And they're always elbowing me or kicking me or popping me on the back of my neck and like, you better stand up. And they're like, as many uh, kids that you've uh, influenced in your life, you better stand up. And it's because I've always done that. I've always mentored, still do, and will continue to do for the rest of my life. But the mission part comes from as I had to sit back and ask the questions, but did I, did I give my all? Could I have given more? And I remember even one night, and this is uh, when I was living in Redondo Beach, and at that point I was living like on the water and I was like looking out at the water 
and in my own little world and I just kind of had a little conversation and I was like, dear, if, if, if there's something you need to share with me, some guidance in life, I'm open, come share, I'm willing to take any information. And I said, and not only that, if you can find the next Miss Myers, you got a better seat than I do. You can see what she's about <laughs> and you can have, you can do a better job of picking her because you know what she's all about. Because folks, my wife made the comment to me about a day or two before she passed away. First, she was just staring at me. And I kept looking at her and I was like, why is she just staring? I mean, because she's just like, and I'm just like, did I do something? And then eventually she just says, I love you so much. And I was like, oh. and so needless to say, that was touching. It still hits me. But um, eventually she went on to say, um, dear, you need a helpmate. In other words, somebody to assist me through the rest of this life journey, a new wife, a new partner. And she says, and you have my blessings. And I'm just like, oh. And that's when it's really start to hit that no miracle is about to take place. That you're really going to have to deal with this. This is something that it's real. It's real. And so it made me really sit back and start to analyze my life and say, what, what are you going to do? And what I was getting to at the window is she actually came to me that night in a dream and she told me about being more patient and you know, the hugging and the, because that's what she loves, the holding hands and the hugging. And she says, do some more of that. And, and more of the being patient was the conversation. And the reason I know she came as a friend is because for me personally, I remember in the dream thinking, I hear you, your conversation, but when we going to hook up, uh, you talking about what I'm going to do, how I should treat a friend. <laughs> what about you being that friend? And when I was awake, it hit me that she came to deliver that message without wanting to send mixed signals. In other words, move on with your life. And at the same time, giving me guidance on some things that I can add so that the next young lady would benefit from that, which I appreciate. Now, for some people, they might hear that conversation and be like, that boy crazy. They didn't get a white jacket for him and lock him up. <laughs> and uh, those that have been through some of those, those kind of conversations understand totally where I'm coming from. But anyway, that's kind of the way it went. But what it did, it made me really sit back and look at my life and, and start to ask more about relationships. Um, again, could I have done more? And so the more books I read, the more seminars I went to, the more people I listened to, the more disturbing it started to get for me, for me. Because I started to recognize that a, the reason a lot of people are having challenges out here is because they're listening to these people that are out here speaking. Because majority, and I do mean majority of them, have never been in a committed relationship themselves. All the information they're sharing is books that they've read, things they've heard from other people that they're repeating, or maybe they shared some tips with other people. Those people used it. They got results and they can share you other people's results. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, folks, and I'm not saying they don't that, that some of these people's information is not good. We can learn from everybody. We can learn from our single friends. We can, we can learn from them how to stay single. But you can learn from everyone. And so don't get that twisted. That's not what I'm saying. But none of them have real experience. I shouldn't say none. Majority of them don't have real, actual, hands-on experience. And then some of those who do have it are telling you what they've learned from their third and their fourth marriages that they've been through. And I'm just like, this is where the people that have stayed in the same marriage for long periods of time and speaking. And so I felt like I had something to offer because the fact is we... We had the bankruptcy. We had the, you know, the acquiring homes and losing homes, the racism that we had to deal with, the kids thing, the cancer. Um, you know, folks, we had some obstacles. We had some challenges. But we're on the same squad. We're committed to fight through whatever life threw at us. 
And for that reason, I feel like I have a lot to offer, to bring to the table. Not he say, she say stuff. Real life fighting through the struggles experience. And again, that's not saying I can't take from other people because I do. And I listen to other people and I take other tips and, you know, because there's things when it comes to kids, people can share certain tips that I haven't had to deal with because I didn't have the kids. Um, I do understand kids, you know, because I had, uh, I remember when um, I had someone, I won't say who, but they used to always tell me when I tell them about dealing with kids, they go, you don't have no kids, you don't know what it's about. And I said, I'm going to let you in on a secret. I used to be a kid. So therefore, I got some insight. So I'm not talking about he says she. See, folks, that's the difference. It amazes me to hear people make that comment when they will tell a person, well, you don't have kids, so you don't understand. Folks, one thing I understand, and I've done a lot of research, I've been doing this for over 35 years. People are people. I don't care if you're talking about a child, an adult, whatever. People, if you understand people, because that same person got to witness of, of when one of my family members lived with me for a while. When they saw that same person, and I'll tell you, it was my niece. She lived with me for a little while. And, um, and the person, I won't put them out there, but they were saying that when this person would come over to my niece, would come over to, to their house or something and do certain things, they go, well, you wouldn't do that at your uncle's house. Interesting. That was the same person who said, I didn't know anything about kids. <laughs> but they'll do stuff at your house that you know they wouldn't do with me. Or that person would come and tell me, well, why don't you get her to do this and this? Or you need to talk to her. Wait, 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 wait. You supposedly hold just as high a position in her life as I do. But I don't understand kids and you've had many kids. Why can't you get her to do what you want her to do? Because see, folks, I understand people. And that's the stuff I believe I bring to the table. That's the thing I'm going to be able to offer out here to the world. And, and even now, I continue to read. I continue. That's a passion of mine. My dad has always got on me. He's like, boy, you good people. Ain't nothing wrong with you. And I'm like, man, I'm going to be here anyway. I might as well strive to get better, be a better son, better husband, better whatever. And so I'm still into always looking to self-develop. And so that's what I'm bringing out here to the world. That's my mission, to assist people to change their lives um, and to live with joy. We came here to experience the, the, the of being a human being, and hopefully most of that will be joyful along the way. But we came for the experience, and that's my goal, is to assist you so that you can get as much joy out of this as possible and have a better understanding. So I'll close with my motto, which is, it ain't right, it ain't wrong. It's my opinion. I hope more people understand what I'm getting at, because if we understand that people have the right to their own opinion, we'll get along better as a society. So again, if you're not having fun, you should be doing something else. Come aboard. Look forward to taking the journey with you. Let's enjoy this thing we call life. Talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.